Welcome to the work solution for the problem I set for you in ELEC 120 Lecture 3. So here is a problem I set you. Um, in the lecture we went through a problem that was a similar situation but we were investigating the forces on charge C which is this one here. Um, what we are now doing this time is we're looking at the resultant force on the charge at position a. Um, but the procedure is very, very similar. So what you need to do is split it into two parts. So we're going to find the effect on charge A due to B and then find the force on charge A due to C. That's really the best way that we can do this. Um, sorry, I just realised I need to close my email otherwise that would pop up. Um, so let's get on with it. So we're going to break it into pieces and we'll get an answer out. So here is my very, very simple drawing. So I, this is what I would do in an exam if I was answering this sort of question. Is I like to sketch the situation I'm working with so I've got more familiarity. What we're doing is, remember, we've got an X direction and a Y direction and we define these ourselves. And all of the directions that we have are going to be relative to those. What we're going to do is going to split up the problem. So first up, we're going to find the force on A due to B. So we're going to be operating in this area. So we can see that there's going to be, um, that if it was just A and B, they'd be acting on each other in a straight line in this direction. So let's see what's happening. So now we're going to split the problem down even further. So we're just looking at charge the force on A due to B, and then we're going to find the X direction and then the Y direction. Remember, it's just using our standard Cartesian coordinate system that we've worked out. We know that the force on a charge is Coulomb's law. In this case, we've got QA and QB, um, but we know that they're the same magnitude, so those can be simplified and jam together in the next step and we know that the distance between them is L squared because that's the length of this um, hypotenuse but it's not there's it's not a straight line it's working in the X direction as well as the Y direction so we have to split this up so what I've done down here is I've drawn the section that we're interested in um, so this is this is charge B and this is charge A um, and I've just added a line in here so the hypotenuse is length L and it was set up in the question that it was an equilateral triangle so we know this angle here is 60 and because this is a right angle this must be 30 um, we can split this up and looking in the X direction, the force in the X direction, so the force going this way, oh, that's not working well, this way is um, the magnitude that we originally had multiplied by cos 60. This is just trigonometry. So um, we've got, that's why I've labeled hypotenuse opposite and adjacent because this is how I work this stuff out. Um, and cos 60 is equal to one half. So that actually simplifies things. So we just get the charge on sorry the charge the force on a due to b is equal to q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught l squared times a half in the x direction that bit's done now we're going to look at the y direction and we're going to use the same triangle as before but we're looking at this time at the y axis we've done x and what we can see here is we've got the magnitudes as we had before but this time we want cos 30 because that will tell us what the what the magnitude is in the upwards direction and cos 30 is root 3 over 2 and this is the magnitude just from this previous step so that is the force on a due to b done um i've got cos 60 and sine 60 the same don't worry that doesn't that's just a note for me because you can you can calculate this using sine rather than cos. It just depends how you set up these triangles. You'll get the same answer because remember you've got this symmetry here um, and that will make a box and you can do it mirror imaged and that will give you the same answer. Now you've done that, that's half of the problem solved. Now we're going to look at the force on A due to C. And now we're looking at the other half of that, equal, of that equilateral triangle we had in the question. So here's A, here's C. We've got our hypotenuse is length L as before. And this time when we calculate the force in the X direction, remember we set up X and Y as standard Cartesian direction. So we can imagine that the force in the x direction is going to be negative because it's going to the left instead of to the right so we put that negative sign in there to remember that 
So the magnitude of the force is QA times QC over 4 pi epsilon naught L squared. Because the magnitudes are the same, we can combine those. And it's cos 60, again, is this direction that we're operating in because it's the adjacent length that we're interested in this triangle. All we're basically doing is finding the length of sides of triangles. It just seems quite complicated because it's got this electrostatics bit thrown into it. So overall, we get our magnitude, the magnitude of the force in the x direction on A due to C is negative Q squared over 4 pi epsilon naught L squared times a half. Right, next, y direction. Is this getting repetitive? Because it pretty much is. You just need to keep breaking the problem down, solving a bit of it, and then we bring it all together at the end. This time, f of y is also acting in the positive y direction, so we don't need to worry about any negative signs. This time, it's cos 30, because we're interested in the opposite rather than the adjacent. And um, I've done it over this side, so these are mirror images. You can do it this way. It doesn't really matter. Um, again, note that cos 30 and sine 60 are the same, so you can do this with signs if you want to. You'll get the same result. Cos 30 is root 3 over 2, as we found before. So we get this answer for the force on A due to C in the y direction. If you've got that far, you've done the difficult bit. Next up, we're going to combine these, these values to get the right solution. So here we get the total resultant force F of R. And what I've done here is this is the force in the x direction on A due to B. And this is the force in the x direction on A due to C. Um, and you've got this negative because one's positive x direction, one's negative x direction. As you notice very usefully, those will cancel out and become zero, which is what we've got down here. The bit along here is the y direction. The y direction, we have this root 3 over 2 plus another root 3 over 2. Um, what we, the actual result of root 3 over 2 is just you, you <laughs> two, uh, root 3 over 2 plus root 3 over 2 is actually just root 3, which we've got down here. So we've got these magnitudes, which are the same, plus multiplied by root 3 rather, not plus multiplied. Um, and that's that's most of the answer. So the resultant force is actually zero in the x direction, which makes sense if you look at our triangle, because if you look at our triangles, you can imagine that B and C are equal magnitudes, and they're both going to be cancelling each other out effectively because they're at this position from A. So the force from B in the x direction is going to be cancelled out by the force due to C in the x direction. So that's why we get zero. Um, and if you think about, we've got this force in the y direction is positive y, because remember, positive y is going to be going upwards. And that makes sense. If you think about A, it's going to be pushed away by B and C. That makes sense. Um, so you scroll down. I've just done this summary. So what we have is just summarise this here. So this is my little phasor diagram. So here was the triangles. Here's A, and we can see A is going to go whoosh away in that direction. So the resultant force is, overall, this is your official answer. The force is equal to root 3, Q squared, over 4 pi epsilon naught L squared, Newtons. That's why N's sticking there. And it's perpendicular to line BC. So that's line BC. You can see it's perpendicular to it. Or in shorthand phasor notation, I can write um, the magnitude at an angle of, that's what this symbol means, plus 90 degrees. And remember, this is relative to the x-axis, and we go anti-clockwise. So the x-axis would be 0, the y-axis is positive 90, negative x is, uh, it's either 180 or positive 180, sorry, positive or negative 180, and then minus y would be minus 90 degrees. But you'll hear more about that form in semester 2. So. As long as you got this answer, you don't need to worry about the shorthand. That's just me adding that there for your future information. So if you got that, well done. This is a very tricky problem. Um, so if you're still struggling with this, please don't worry. It's at the start of the course, but this is kind of the tricky type of uh, electrostatics, the trickiest type of electrostatics questions I'm likely to ask you.